Hello and welcome. I'm Will, and I'm Alicia. This is Enter the Rabbit Hole. Each week, we dive into and dissect the weird, the momentous, and the downright interesting. And today, we're covering cannibalism. Yes,、uh, everybody's favorite.、Uh, Alicia, how you doing? So this week, we've been researching a lot of different types of cannibalism, and.、Mm. Normally,、uh, I'm not really a dream kind of person,、mm-hmm. uh, but I have been having a few nightmares, and I've been seeing a lot of like cute videos of animals online, and、mm-hmm. all I can think is no, 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 no. Yeah, I. It's so funny that you should mention the nightmares because last night I had a terrible sleep. I had a very vivid dream that in. Uh, in the dream are sugar gliders.、Uh, we own sugar gliders, but heads up, we don't live in the UK. So before you go phone the RSPCA to get us reported for having exotic animals,、uh, don't bother because we don't live there. Also, they're rescues. They are rescues. We find them in the park. Anyway, so I had a dream that one of our sugar gliders was sick, so she was really docile and and kind of sleepy. And I was trying to revive her, and while I was trying to revive her, our other sugar glider climbed over my hand and. Then And started trying to eat her like a boa constrictor, like put her head inside of his mouth, and so I kind of flung him away and then hurt him, and it was horrible. It was, <laughs> and I can only ascribe that to、uh, one,、uh, my profound love for our pets, and two, reading way too much stuff about cannibalism. So much, yeah.、Uh, so many articles, so many books about cannibalism, all for you, all for you guys. So hope you like it, yay. Anyway, so Lee, do you want to start us off with?、Uh, What is cannibalism? Okay, so let's start off with the etymology of the word cannibalism. So,、uh, way back when Columbus, our favorite、uh, murderous rapist, explorer, he、yeah. he discovered America. No、yeah. one knew it was there before. No,、uh, nobody lived there.、Um, nobody had lives or、yep. um, the end. Yep. Anyway,、uh, he went to the West Indies, quote unquote West Indies,、um, mm-hmm. and he found native people there. And the native people had rumors about a tribe called the Carib, who were man eaters, quote unquote.、Mm-hmm. They they were cannibals. When Columbus wrote back to Queen Isabella about this, she gave him carte blanche to murder and or enslave anybody who ate human beings. So Columbus. Is obviously trying to find gold,、uh, and when he can't find any gold on this island, he blames the native people. And in order to enslave、uh, and justify murdering them all, he calls them all Caribs and all cannibals. So this is basically the colonial era equivalent of he was reaching for a gun. I saw it. Oh. Uh, okay, there was no gun, but I do. I you know a lot. A lot of these natives have guns on them. Um, that's basically what he's doing here, right? Yeah, I mean, they're brown people for one, so they they already had the odds stacked against them. Yeah. So the word becomes cannibal through like a a game of like intercontinental telephone.、Mm-hmm. So it starts with carib, then becomes canibe, and then turns into cannibal. So it originally refers to all of these tribes, hence like Caribbean, but becomes cannibal or cannibal. So the the very term cannibal and cannibalism already starts off problematic. Yeah, racist. It's yeah. it's already a, a way to demonize people simply for not having the money that you wanted them to have. Yeah, where's my gold, guys? Where's my gold? So, but don't feel too bad about that, guys, because you you weren't to know that, and it is still the the given term any time that we talk about animals eating one another or humans eating one another. That is the the common nomenclature. So today we're going to be focusing primarily on animal cannibalism. The prevailing thought in the scientific community at one point was that animal cannibalism. Which is going to be really hard for me to say throughout this. <laughs> Try and say it three times quick. Animal cannibalism. Animal cannibalism. Say,、so、I think animal cannibal sounds really good. Animal cannibal. Yeah. Animal cannibal. Okay. But if you say it three times in the mirror, then some cannibal animals will show up in your in your bathroom. But that's fine because there's it's a different species.、So、They're not、matter. coming for you. Yeah.、Uh, so the prevailing thought at one time in the scientific community was that. This was very much the exception rather than the rule. Very much limited to a certain number of species, and that you only saw it amongst animals that had 
being forced into starvation. So their their typical food source was taken away from them. So they were resorting to eating their own kind, what they what is sometimes termed conspecific cannibalism. So recently we found out that that's not true at all. In fact, cannibalism is recorded in over 1,500 different animal species. So this idea of attaching human morality to animal behavior has hindered scientific progress. We often find that cannibalism isn't a last resort at all. It's documented behavior with real reasons behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not just that these animals are starving and they can't find any other food source. There are many reasons why an animal will engage in cannibalism. Yeah, and that's what we're going to be diving into today, isn't it? Some of the reasons behind this animal cannibalism. So, uh, Leash, would you uh, like to get us started off? Sure, let's talk about animal cannibalism and the environment. So, one of our big sources in today is a book called Cannibalism by Bill Shoup. Cannibalism, a perfectly natural history, is that correct? I believe so. In his book, he has a quote that says, Cannibalism can promote the survival of the species as a whole by culling the weak and bolstering the strong. Mm. So one of the reasons you might need to cull the weak is because of environmental pressures. So environmental pressures can be evidenced in... Decreasing habitat size, decreasing food source, uh, or stress, for example, hens who are being factory farmed. All of these can cause cannibalism in animals. On that note, this did lead to one of my favorite little tidbits from Bill Schitt's book. Something that farmers were able to buy at one point, and I believe still able to purchase to this day, are these tiny little red lens spectacles that they can put on individual hens to stop them attacking one another. So they would often clip a hen's beak in order for the hen to stop pecking its flock mates or the, yeah. the other hens around it. But It's what they refer to as the pecking order, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. Um, and so they put these little, quote-unquote, rose-tinted glasses on the hens uh, in order to stop them from being aggressive. You should look up a picture of them because... Uh, they're quite funny looking. They do just look like hipster chickens, don't they? Yeah, uh, but they have been largely phased out. They're they're most popular in the 40s and 50s. It's almost as though somebody looked at that and said, hmm, putting tiny glasses on thousands and thousands of chickens might be kind of cumbersome and, and uh, difficult to carry out. Hmm, strange. So, Alicia... We all know that chickens can be vicious little menaces, but were you aware that even hippos indulge in cannibalism? See, I knew hippos are, what, the most dangerous land animal in yeah. Africa, but I didn't know that they were cannibals. Mm. We all knew that they could be hungry, hungry. So uh, a group of hippos in the National Park in Zimbabwe in the 1990s were caught dining on each other's corpses, uh, as well as the corpses of wildebeest. So the suggestion here was that environmental pressures and drought may have forced the hippos to switch from their traditional diet. Hippos apparently eat around 40 kg of grass per day, uh, and then this made them switch over to meat instead. Uh, a group of cannibalistic, meat-eating hippos just, like, combing the savanna is a, a terrifying thought. It's, it's the like, stuff of nightmares. It's a B-grade horror movie. It is. It's just waiting for Nollywood to get a hold of it. Um, yeah, it terrifying stuff. Um, so that's a stress-related factor. There are other factors, like... For some species, it's just a way to quickly outgrow a stage when they are vulnerable to predation or a dangerous environment. For example, there's the spadefoot toad. So these, they lay their eggs in these transitory ponds, so they live in a very arid environment. And uh, a heavy rain can cause a pond to form, but because they live in such a hot environment, the pond can dry up very quickly, which means that the tadpoles need to grow very quickly. In order to grow faster, some of the tadpoles become cannibalistic. So they develop more quickly than their vegetarian counterparts, and they even develop this kind of keratinous tooth that the other tadpoles don't have. So they have this sharp, spiky tooth in order to eat their brothers and sisters. 
and they grow almost twice as fast. And when you look at the pond, they look like two entirely different species of tadpoles. Yeah, and I think Bill Shoot was talking about how this rapid growth is triggered by an increase in protein in some of the some of the tadpoles diet is that correct i think so um it what this does is allows them to grow faster and therefore they're able to leave the pond before it dries out if they're simply vegetarian then they may be stuck in the pond and die when it when it dries out on the subject of cannibalistic amphibians, uh, what do you know of the tiger salamander? It's a ti- uh, It's a salamander that looks like a tiger? Yeah, exactly. You've got it in one. Nailed it! Uh, so they are these black and yellow salamander creatures, which uh, they in- indulge in a similar form of cannibalism at a younger stage, a larval stage. So the larvae will attack and eat smaller larvae, and the larger cannibalistic larvae can have teeth that are three times larger than their normal counterparts, which is just the stuff of nightmares, just looking at a lineup of salamanders and just having them grin at you in turn, and then seeing this one that's just got like giant like Sasquatch teeth is pretty... I don't know, a lot of this is, is a little bit triggering for me. Mm. I mean, as a child, I used to catch both frogs and salamanders and just don't think of them as, like, cannibals. And I guess that's us putting our own emotions into animals, which they don't think that way. Yeah, well, you and I are both members of the Pokemon generation, and you don't look at Poliwog and think, hmm, I wonder how many other Poliwogs he killed to to get out in the wild. I think about that every day. I mean, yeah. Uh, okay, so what are we talking about next? Uh, so there are other reasons uh, for cannibalism and other uh, methods. So, for example, some adults will cannibalize their young because they are so nutrient-rich. A lot of fish do this. Uh, and the reason why people think so many, why scientists think so many fish do this is because they can't really identify their young they look at a series of their eggs in the same way that we would look at a handful of raisins, according to, to Bill Shute. Hmm. Um, so, for example, trout, cod, ocean sunfish, all of these fish have very nutrient-rich uh, offspring. Um, and because the amount of eggs and young is so large, they will just snack on a lot of their eggs. Hmm. Sometimes the males have to guard the cache of eggs, and they can't leave the eggs in order to eat, so they have to fast. And instead of fasting, they will nibble at their own supply of eggs, mm -hmm. which can lead to some female fish laying their eggs on top of another female's fish in the hopes oh. that the male will eat the other fish's young first before he starts to eat their own babies. That is a very tricky evolutionary step that they've taken there. I think Bill Shit also mentions some species of fish that engage in mouth brooding. So there are some fish that keep their eggs in their mouth and their babies in their mouth. But of course, this could lead to some problems. Yeah, as you could imagine, uh, anyone who's tried to... I don't know, like when you're brushing your teeth and you've got like a mouthful of of like toothpaste and, and you're trying to think what to do with it. I was thinking more in terms of uh, anytime you have a hard candy in your mouth okay, and your brain is like, don't bite it, don't bite it, don't bite it. And then... And you do love your hard candies. So, I really do. Yeah, that is a real willpower thing for you. The thing that I loved in Bill Shute's book, this is... I, we can't recommend this book highly enough. It's so comprehensive, but it's also got a real kind of conversational and and funny as well as very insightful and very analytical tone to it. Uh, he talks about explaining mouth brooding and specifically mouth insemination <laughs> to young learners. So, uh, you, you know, if you have a mouthful of unfertilized eggs and they get fertilized in your mouth by the male of your species, we'll, we'll let you do the math. We'll let you uh, work out what that looks like. Picture it. Yeah, just imagine it. Not the most disturbing thing I've heard in terms of in utero behavior from fish. Let's talk sand tiger sharks. So 
a lot of people aren't maybe fans of sharks in the first place. Anyone who watched Jaws when they were little is probably firmly in that camp. Sand tar- tiger sharks engage in some truly mm, horrific behavior uh, even before they get out of the womb. So uh, this is a species of shark in which the, the young become fully fertilized inside of the female rather than being fertilized inside of eggs outside of the female. Uh, so they will have multiple offspring uh, inside of each u- utero, uterus. They're called uh, oviducts, I believe. Thank you. Uh, inside each oviduct. However, as soon as these eggs are fertilized, it then becomes uh, a mini survival of the fittest. So uh, the largest of the offspring will begin snacking on their uh, brethren. They'll engage in a little game of siblicide, uh, until only two remain, so one in each oviduct. The idea being that when these sand tiger sharks uh, enter the water when they're birthed, they they already enter with experience of hunting and, and killing other animals. Um, can you imagine giving birth to a baby that's got a full set of teeth? Yeah, imagine if people did that. Imagine mm. if you had, like, you always had twins, and then the twins fight to the death inside your womb. Yeah. That's there would be so many TV shows about that. I'm creeped out by twins to begin with, so that that's not helpful. Other animals that snack on their young? It's pretty common with rodent species, hamsters, rats, ground squirrels. They will often eat their young if uh, the babies are sick or dead or if there are just too many young to feed. There's a favorite like childhood pet. I think you had one of these, a, a golden hamster. I no, I didn't. We had guinea pigs. Oh, okay. So- which which I cannot uh not recommend enough because they are just perpetually scared, perpetually pooping, and just always always running away from you and squealing. They're not fun they're not fun pet for kids. I don't know why they're sold to kids. Maybe yours just really didn't like you. I I think that might be it. So golden hamsters are really popular with children. They are very cute. But if they are handled, like if uh, a female is pregnant and she's handled before, during, or after her pregnancy, Mm. she will cannibalize her young. Um, There are a lot of other behaviors, for example, if she's stressed out or if there is maybe a male too close to her, there's a lot of reasons for her to cannibalize her young. So if you do have a golden hamster, uh, one, maybe just don't let it get pregnant, but two, if it is, put it in a separate cage and leave it alone. Do yeah. not touch it. I think Bill should point out as well that the golden hamsters are uh, some of the worst for this infanticide behavior because they have the lowest gestation period of any mammals. So I think you've got like African elephants on one end of the scale and then on the other you've got golden hamsters who uh, their gestation period is 16 days and then within the space of I think uh, a week or two they they can... Go, go back into, uh, I want to say oasis. Oasis <laughs> is not the word for, no. for when you are <laughs> producing eggs. Uh, uh, I don't know. You put me on the spot here. The, so they're ready to have kids again um, very quickly. Also, the, the young only take four weeks to reach sexual maturity. Yeah. So they can then be seen as a threat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they don't mind uh, engaging in some Lannister uh, levels of incest either, so... The disturbing imagery just goes on and on, and I think the more that these creatures become, the the closer they are to human, the more disturbing it is. So let's talk primates, let's talk monkeys, specifically tamarind monkeys. So one report that I read quoted this researcher, Lawrence Coulot, who described watching tamarind monkeys in the wild and mention one incident in particular in which a mustache tamarind uh, in the wild to Peru, Collot and his colleagues watched as a mother tamarind forged for fruit with her adult daughter and infant son. Suddenly, the mother bit through her baby's skull and ate out its brain. Once the mother had eaten the entire head, her adult daughter feasted on the carcass. The researchers suggest that the grisly act may have occurred to benefit the adult daughter, who was pregnant at the time. Sacrificing her own infant may have bettered uh, her daughter's offspring's chance of survival. There's something about that. Everyone's having a nice day out, we're having a bit of fruit, and then all of a sudden, like, I'm going to eat your brains. I think it's the suddenness of it, that the they're just, like, foraging for fruit. They're not even starving, and it's just this, like, 
looking around, looking around. Yeah, I think there's something about the image of babies skulls as well because you know like an infant baby they've got those soft they've got the the little soft spot in the middle of their heads and and they're just so they're just so vulnerable in that specific area the idea of a mum just uh do 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 and just chomping through the top of that i don't know why it's worse for me thinking about a monkey doing that than a human i think it's because they're so cute yeah and and you know I, i'm really personalizing this for me monkeys are some of my favorite animals i i, I like the way that, and and we really are anthropomorphizing them here, but the way that they caper and play with one another, and the way that they problem solve, and and they look human in so many different ways, but they but they look cuter than we do. Uh, so to think of them engaging in this kind of behavior, I think, is particularly disturbing. <laughs> In terms of other animals that cannibalize young, there are quite a few birds that kind of have cannibalism built into the reproductive system, kind of like the sand tiger shark. But in terms of birds, there there are a couple that lay what are called insurance eggs. So they, they may lay one or two eggs where they take very good care of these eggs. The third egg is not given the same amount of hormones and when it's hatched it's weaker than the other the other baby birds if food is abundant then this young is usually kicked out of the nest and and killed if food is scarce the siblings will cannibalize the the weakest baby this egg is also used if the first two die then there is some chance of the offspring offspring succeeding but it's not very common that this third or second egg lives it it's unusual isn't it and i think this is one of the reasons why researchers struggle to get their head around the idea of cannibalism that is not strictly for the purpose of foraging or it's not caused by external environmental pressures this question of why would nature build in this mechanism where whereby you would have disposable children you would have like a part of your brood they're simply either to A, get eaten for nutrients, or B, if you don't need nutrients, it's just kicked out so it's no longer a drain on, on the family unit. I think it it's one because we think in terms of reproduction being the main reason for survival, right? So we think, well, you have to take care of your young. But if we take this to its logical conclusion, they are doing that. Mm. They're giving some of them the best chance of survival at what they see as a low cost. Certainly. In terms of other mammals that engage in cannibalism, there are bears, lions, chimpanzees. A lot of males will kill off young in order to make the females more receptible to mating. So if a female loses her young, so a female tiger sorry, a female lion, loses her young, uh, she will become receptive to mating again with a male very quickly. But if she still has cubs, then it will take her one to two years to become receptive to a new partner. I think I remembered the term that I was struggling for earlier and I thought it was oasis. It's not oasis, it's uh, estrus. Uh. So uh, she will she will be forced back into estrus when if she loses her young prematurely. Let's just keep going with Oasis. Okay, so she'll be forced back into Oasis. <laughs> she'll go back to the Britpop movement of mm. ni the mid-90s uh, and just really enjoy their guitar riffs and indie sounds. I think uh, in terms of, uh, not in terms of Oasis or Wonderwall, but back to polar bears, there is an image of a polar bear, polar bear male carrying a cub's head and spinal cord. Mm-hmm. And this caused a lot of outrage because people thought that the reason polar bears were cannibalizing was because of a decrease in polar ice. Mm -hmm. While this may lead to more cannibalism, it's not true that polar bears didn't engage in this type of cannibalism before. It was common for males to kill cubs, and that's why females will go 
away from a male's territory in order to raise her young. Yeah, it's we're not saying that climate change doesn't exist here. Uh, Enter the Rabbit Hole is a, <laughs> a pro climate change podcast. We're we're in favor of it. Uh... We, we like it. <laughs> We believe that it's real, and we're not arguing against it, but it does kind of damage your case against people who might deny the effects of man-made climate change when articles like this come about and the, the message behind it isn't fully researched. So the, th- the thinking here is that that polar bear was basically trying to force a female polar bear into heat. It could be that, mm-hmm. uh, or it could just be that uh, the cub was easy meat. Yeah, I see. So let's talk a little bit about matrophagy. So uh, instances where the mother might give over part of part of her body or her entire body in order to f- feed her young. Uh, again, we're going back to arachnids. So arachnids seem to be kind of the the main offenders, if you like, in any form of animal cannibalism. So specifically, crab spiders provide their young with unfertilized eggs to eat. However, uh, in addition to that, they'll also provide themselves as a kind of final meal. Uh, Spiderlings that engage in this practice are noted as having higher weights and survival rates of those who don't. So the crab spider will basically uh, lay down um, in the the middle of her brood and they, they just go to town. They just turn turn it into a mummy smorgasbord. You know, I already didn't really plan on having kids, but certainly the thought of giving my body to babies to feast on yeah. is... Well, it's important to know that babies aren't like uh, spiders or, or even pigs. Like, if a, if a baby sees you in a prone position, its uh, instinct isn't to go and eat you just because it thinks you're dead. I'm not so sure. Okay, well, the jury's still out in that one. In other matrophagal practices, uh, let's talk Sicilians. Sicilians. Not Sicilians. Not Sicilians. Not people from Sicily. Uh, People from Sicily don't typically let their babies eat them. But Sicilians, which are kind of... They're a subterranean amphibian, but they look a lot like earthworms. They look like a mix of a snake and a worm. They look like... It, it sounds like we're doing a, a roast of Sicilians. <laughs> the podcast has taken a real pivot. They, they look like the the sandworm from Dune, mm. but if it were teeny tiny. So like a worm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and there's not like um, people riding on its back and like searching for spices and well, stuff. As far as we can see. <clears throat> tiny, teeny tiny people. Anyway, so in late term viviparous pregnancies so these are pregnancies where the the young gestate inside of the female uh, the young have been known to consume the uterine lining of the mother's womb using tiny hooked or concave baby teeth weird uh, that are then reabsorbed after birth uh, the oviparous species go one better so these are uh, species where the female gives birth to a brood of eggs outside of the the female's body so in a 2006 study of one african species of uh, Sicilians. Researchers noted the young engaging in dermatophagy, the eating of the flesh. Yep. So uh, the researcher was quoted as saying, looking closer, they noticed that the babies were pressing their heads against the female, then pulling away with her skin clamped tightly between their jaws. As the researchers watched, the baby Sicilians peeled the outer layer of their mother's skin like a grape. Mm. Way to put me off grapes. Sorry. But she doesn't die from this, right? No, she doesn't. So she she's basically my understanding is that she uh, regrows the skin as the as the babies are eating her. I mean, I guess that means she doesn't have to forage for food. If you had some excess skin, let's say, ladies, you've had a baby. We're not all Kim Kardashian. You can't get... We're going to be talking about her again later in the podcast, uh, you know, foreshadowing. Uh, We're not all Kim K. uh, So we're not all going to get that beach body like three weeks after you've had a baby. You got a little bit of excess stomach fat, okay? What if your babies just came along... And they had a little nibble, 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 nibble on your uh, stomach fat. And that's how you get that beach body. I'll pass. Yeah. That's okay. That's probably not how it works anyway. Uh, <laughs> so what are we talking about next? We've talked uh, about a lot of different forms of cannibalism. But I think one that a lot of people are pretty familiar with is praying mantises. This mm. idea of like sexual cannibalism of like an insect biting off the head of another insect 
in like the throes of passion. Yeah, to the extent like you you could compare uh particularly what's the word like the image of a femme fatale in the human world could almost be compared commonly to like a female praying mantis. I think if you were to say like oh she she's like a she's like a praying mantis, people would immediately know what you were talking about. Yeah, they think that she had long scythe like arms, uh, mm-hmm. these big bulbous eyes. She can change you. colors. Yeah. She just stands next to a flower and you're like, where is she? Um so that's the the image that immediately comes to mind. And the thing is a lot of the lab studies which have brought about this notion that every female praying mantis engages in uh, sexual cannibalism with her partner, even that sexual cannibalism is somehow better for the reproduction process, that apparently the mates, uh, the the males go on to uh, gy- gyrate. I'm going to use the term gyrate as though they're they're like Channing Tatum in, in Magic Mike. Uh, they, they gyrate more vigorously after losing their head, I guess, that their bodies just in, in go into like pure motor function. The problem with that is that a lot of the lab studies, they apparently were depriving the females of, of some or all of their food before allowing them to encounter the males. So th- these studies are already slightly biased or slightly skewed ahead of time. That being said, there are quite a few instances of sexual cannibalism, and mm-hmm. especially in cases of <laughs> sexual dimorphism. Yeah, so sexual dimorphism, for those who don't know, is where the male and the female of the species are typically different sizes or different shapes. In the case of arachnids and other insects, it's typically that the female is substantially larger than the male. Mm. And in these cases, the males are cannibalized a a lot more often than the females. Mm -hmm. So one example could be the Australian redback spider. Again, we're back to spiders. Um, That's because they're evil. That's not true. Spiders are very good for the ecosystem. I just, they terrify me. There is one in the room with you right now, and it's watching you, but you can't see it. Carry on. Oh, uh, I don't know if I can. Um, in So in this species, the intracoital cannibalism occurs in around 65% of sexual encounters. So males are a lot smaller than females in mm-hmm. this species. And males that are cannibalized tend to perform longer sexually than those who aren't cannibalized. They do this weird thing. So... The male approaches the female in the web. Uh, they hey, the ma- baby. Hey, hey, hey. Uh, mon cher. <laughs> and I imagine that she says absolutely nothing and just stares. Um, so then he tries some light nagging and then he comes back like he's peacocking. He's peacocking. He's, he's got like a, a big old leaf. Yeah, he's got like a purple starter cap and, and some like, you know, really shiny jewelry. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um... So the males mate with the female eventually, and then they do this somersault so that they bring their body into the female's mouth, like into her jaws. Mm -hmm. She then spits out enzymes, which start to digest the male's body. If he survives this, he will crawl back with part of his body dissolved and attempt to mate again. If he is successful, he will then throw himself back into her mouth. Typical man, only interested in one thing, can't get enough. God, it's that and cars. <laughs> <laughs> Little tiny spider cars. <laughs> Little tiny spider cars. Uh, so why? Why all this sexual cannibalism? Who does it benefit? There are several hypotheses for this. We're going to go through them. So the first one is adaptive foraging. So females see mates as potential additional sources of nutrients. Plain and simple. Uh, So this is especially important for egg development and growth. In some cases, males may provide females with lipids and proteins that they otherwise lack. So they're getting something from the males that they wouldn't otherwise get from their their typical diet. Uh, There's another reason for this, or another hypothesis, uh, which is aggressive spillover. So this is considered more likely to be witnessed in species with highly aggressive females. Uh, and the researchers who have investigated this define aggressivity in females as being uh, a lower latency in attack time and uh, consumption of prey. So there's no wait time. Yeah, so they see they see food, 
They see food, they eat it. They go for it. Seafood, eat food. Seafood, yeah. eat food. They're on the seafood diet. So uh, in species where they see this kind of high aggressivity, they think that the females are seeing the male and they, they're just seeing a potential source of food. And before even thinking about it, they just attack them. Another reason might be mate choice. So in some species of arachnids, females will be very selective about the males that they cannibalize. And it's based on those that they deem to be less desirable as potential mates. Some female orb weavers will cannibalize males displaying less aggressive courtship uh, rituals. So they do like a little dance. Uh, so sad. (laughs) I know, right? Like it's it's the equivalent of... uh, like a uh, a little like forty year old office worker who's like, oh, but ladies like to dance, so I learned a dance for you. Let me show you, and then you put. She it just off. pulls out a gun and shoots him in the face. <laughs> exactly. I mean, how many times have we seen that story? Um. So in terms of this, there's also the the desert wolf spider, mm-hmm. and it kind of flips this on its head in terms of females being more likely to cannibalize males. In this instance, the males have dent and the females have to enter the den in order to mate. But the males are more likely to cannibalize a female if she isn't a quote-unquote virgin. So if she has mated with another spider, then he is more likely to cannibalize her. Slut shaman. It's disgusting. Absolutely filthy. Hashtag... Uh, wolf spiders too. So the final hypothesis that we're going to talk about in terms of why so many species engage in this kind of sexual cannibalism is just a, a case of classic mistaken identity. So the suggestion is that females engage in aggressive behavior because they don't see or they mistake the courtship ritual of a potential mate. There's actually little evidence to support this hypothesis, especially due to difficulty distinguishing between this and the other hypotheses. So, like, how can you place yourself in the mind of a species of spider to tell whether or not she is able to see a potential mate and and how that differs from her just being highly aggressive or highly selective or looking for a potential source of nutrients? If she reaches into her purse for the pepper spray... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it doesn't help if the male has been, like, following her down a back alley and, mm. you know, like, taking all the same turns that she has. So, it's fair to say that the jury is still out on uh, why different species engage in this kind of sexual cannibalism. And it'd be fair to say that th- there's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all answer here. Different species could have different reasons for doing what they do. Now... You were going to talk a little bit about one thing that I came across, which I thought was simultaneously very cool, very creepy. So I know that people have talked about like parasites um, possibly being like a cause of like the zombie virus uh, yeah. in humans later on. I don't know what you mean. I, I haven't watched a zombie movie in the past uh, 10, 20 years. It's, are, are people making zombie movies? Oh, uh, no, not anymore. I don't are there so. any zombie TV shows? No, I don't. No? Oh, okay. Um... So there is a species of Irish freshwater shrimp that can become the host to a parasite. This parasite is so small. It's like the size of a human red blood cell. Um, And according to the Royal Society of Open Science in 2015, it's not uncommon for this shrimp to indulge in eating some of their young regularly. But this goes into overdrive when they are infected by this parasite. The tiny parasite, only as large as a human red blood cell, uh, exists in the muscle fiber of their hosts in the millions, and they demand more and more food to survive. This, in turn, makes the shrimp hungrier but less able to catch their traditional prey, turning their attention instead to their unsuspecting juveniles, which they gobble up quicker and in greater numbers than they would normally. Fortunately, this parasite cannot be transferred to humans. Yeah, so before you think of, like, boycotting shrimp that come out of Ireland or shrimp in general, don't worry about it. You pr- That's probably not what's going to bring about the end of the world. you got so many other things to worry about. Oh, there's so many things to worry about. Yeah. All right, uh, on that <laughs> note, let's talk a little bit about cannibalism through factory farming, shall we? Uh, specifically mad cow disease. Now, I was really interested when we came across this in the book and in our research because this is something that I remember happening when I was a kid. And just the term mad cow disease, if you're like, uh, 
I must have been about five years old at the time, even if you know nothing else about it, you know it's not good. So uh, this basically, the, the prevalence of factory farming, a lot of people think that this might increase the potential risk of animal to animal disease transmission. And, and we've seen a lot of cases of this, even where consumption of animals by other animals doesn't take place or even where consumption of uh, the animal meat doesn't take place. So I'm thinking about things like swine flu or avian flu, etc. But mad cow disease, BSE, bovine spongiform, encephalopathy, encephalop encephalop I'm going to call it BSE. It basically means spongy brain disease for cows is a progressive neurological disorder that is caused by an infection from degenerative proteins. These proteins are known as prions, and they then go on to affect other previously healthy proteins in the host. So if you, if you are infected by prions, they then go and create more prions inside of your brain. Now, in 1986, the first cases of BSE were identified in British cows. So according to the CDC and other sources, the prevailing theory here is that these cows were infected after being fed ground up meal made from other cattle, including sheep. These sheep were thought to have been infected by a similar prion disease known as scrapie. If you had to name a nasty sounding disease, you can't you can't go far wrong with scrapie. Yeah, you know, some some diseases you hear them and you're like, hmm, scientific or that doesn't sound so bad. If I heard oh, uh, doctor, what's what's the matter? You have scrapie. I would think that I would uh have really like painful shins from then on. Is that does that sound I would right? think something maybe in terms of like open sores. Yeah, it definitely sounds worse than like Lyme disease. Lyme disease mm. sounds kind of refreshing, a little bit <laughs> tropical. Um, so these these cattle were thought to have been infected with scrapie that were then ground up and fed to British cows. Now this led to an epidemic of BSC amongst British cattle with a peak in 1993 where around a thousand new cases were reported every week. So this had wide ranging ram ramifications for farmers, distributors, consumers. There were, uh, a you know, I remember a genuine conversation around uh, whether or not to go to Tesco or go to Asda and buy mints so that you could make burgers. Uh, a lot of people were freaked out by this. Yeah, and I was quite young when this happened, and obviously I lived in the US, but I remember my parents talking about not buying meat from the UK, and mm -hmm. then I remember meat f from the UK being banned. And it's only recently that you can buy beef from the UK now. Yeah, I've got my own little anecdote and I'll, and I'll explain the rest of this and then circle back to, to that one. So the last reported case of the in uh, BSE in the UK weren't until 2015. There were two reported cases in 2016. Now, it wasn't in uh, until 2016 that uh, we were actually given the all clear. Uh, so there's strong evidence to suggest a link between consumption of BSE infected meat and the human variant of BSE, which is VCJD, which is variant Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, is probably how it's meant to be said. So there's the the researcher has said there's strong epidemi epidemiologic and laboratory evidence exists for a causal association between a new human prion disease called VCJD that was first reported from the United Kingdom in 1996 and the BSE outbreak in cattle. The interval between the most likely period for the initial extended exposure of the population to potential BSE contaminated food, around about 1984 to 1986, and the onset of initial uh, uh, variant CJD cases, 1994 to 1996, is consistent with known incubation periods for the human form of prion disease. So basically, you could get infected with it today and have it not show up until 10 years from now, which is pretty scary. Um, so those infected with CJD go through a similar neurological breakdown uh, to cows that were infected with BSE. Potentially, you would survive around about a year following the first symptoms. You, there, there are a lot of different symptoms, but basically your brain slowly but surely shuts down. Eventually, it results in a coma and then death. There is currently no known cure or treatment. So it's the problem is that it's not like an infection or something that you can kill. It's like a self-replicating protein strand that's folded on itself. Yeah. And 
uh, this can just happen. Mm -hmm. Not not that it's likely to happen, so don't freak out. No, 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 no. calm down. You're fine. You're okay. <laughs> um, but it could just appear in, in the neurological tissue of a cow or a human, this protein strand while replicating can fail and, and fold and then create more folded strands. Mm -hmm. And this causes death. Yeah, so it wasn't until much later that I became aware of the fact that you get BSE from cows in its human form by consuming any of the brain tissue or the spinal, uh, the spinal cord tissue from these BSE infected cows. If you're going to a restaurant and getting a steak, that's not a problem. So you can go and order a steak because it comes from a different part of the cow. You can have it medium, you can have it rare, whatever you want. However, because when you buy beef mints, most of it comes from the animal's muscle. However, there are bits and bobs of other bits and pieces that can end up in there. Can't guarantee that brain tissue won't come in. So I remember working in a, a restaurant and this was not that long ago. We we're only talking like 2015 maybe. And we had a tourist come in and ask, oh, can I get a burger? Uh, I want it rare. Can you ask the chef to have it rare? And I went and I was like, chef, um, yeah, the guy on the table, whatever, wants a rare burger, any chance? He was like, I can't do that flat out. I can't do it rare. And then he pointed out that in admittedly minuscule chance of it being BSE laden mints. However, I mean, what if it's something that can lay in your system for 10 years and then and then kill you very badly? Would you want to take that risk? So does cooking it? Stop. No, this is the problem with these prions is that once they're there, they're there. So you can't you can't kill them with something like antibiotics, which is why even in modern factory farming, where so much of our uh, meat is laden with antibiotics, which is a whole other problem that we could do a podcast about. You you also can't kill it through things like radiation or heat treatment. Yeah. So don't even try nuking your burger because it won't work. It won't work. Oh, that's a fun note to end on. Mm. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've had quite a while to talk about animal cannibalism, but let's be honest, the real thing you want to hear about is human cannibalism. Yeah, we know what you like, you dirty, dirty ducks. You're sick. Mm. But not as sick as us, because we've been looking into this for weeks. Yeah, and also thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Yeah, you dirty, dirty ducks. Um, so should we jump into human cannibalism just now or is this a, would this be a lovely time for a segue? I think this will be a nice time for a break. All right, wonderful. We're gonna take that break, cleanse ourselves, think cleansing thoughts, and we'll chat to you again soon. Ciao. Enter the Rabbit Hole is written and presented by William Grant and Alicia Palmer. The music was created by Glenn Marshall. More information and sources can be found in the episode description. You can email us at etrhthepod at gmail or follow us on Instagram at etrhthepod. Thanks for listening. <laughs>